Hello everyone and welcome to episode 4 of Space Code Foundation's interview series for women of color in space. I'm Nivedita Raju, Director of Legal Affairs and Research at Space Court. At the Foundation, we firmly believe in the benefit of outer space for all of humankind. Each episode of this series features a different speaker, highlighting their experiences in the international space sector as a woman of color. This week, we're excited to feature Dr. Gina Halabi. She is an astrophysicist, a social entrepreneur, and was the first person to obtain her PhD in astrophysics from a Lebanese university. Welcome, Gina. Could you please tell us a little bit more about your journey and how you chose this career? I hadn't always thought and plan to be an astrophysicist, to be honest. Many people who become eventually astronomers uh, or astrophysicists, they'd always be thinking about the cosmos and the stars and the sky. Of course, I was fascinated as a child by the stars, but I'm not sure I even knew what it meant to become an astrophysicist. I was very curious as a child, very, very curious. I always asked why. And so perhaps it seemed like a natural thing for me to become a scientist. My two siblings are also scientists as well. My sister is a biologist, my brother is a chemist. So there might also be something in our household that kind of drove us down that path. Um, so I studied physics and then I felt after I got my degree, I felt there must be something more to learn, something more to try. So I did a master's degree and then I did my PhD in astrophysics. I was interested in many different things and I, I met who later became my PhD supervisor and he told me about his research, the stars, how they evolve, their role in the universe. And, you know, I was sold uh, the idea straight away. Um, but as you mentioned, no one had obtained a PhD in astrophysics in Lebanon before. So my degree was the first homegrown PhD in astrophysics. And that meant I had to forge that path for myself. There was no user manual for how to get that degree. And it wasn't easy. Um, and for your listeners, I really want to emphasize that there were, you know, lots of frustrations and doubt. And I often asked myself, how meaningful is what I'm doing? You always e evaluate these choices. Um, there were lots of sleepless nights. It's really, really hard work, but it was worth it. That's incredible. And after becoming a lecturer in Beirut and completing your postdoc in Cambridge, you founded She Speaks Science. Could you tell us a little bit more about the program and its objective? Um, as you mentioned, I for a while I worked at the American University of Beirut, where I got my PhD. I worked as a lecturer there. Uh, I taught physics courses. And then I, um, I was offered a position in the University of Cambridge, where I'm now based, to work as a researcher, as a postdoc. And so I moved here in 2015. During my postdoc, I started becoming more and more involved in promoting STEM among the young people. You know, given my own background, I was the first person to get a PhD in astrophysics from a Lebanese university, and that's okay. But what is not okay and what is not acceptable, that I be the last one. Right. And so I felt that I had a duty there, a role to play. I wanted the Lebanese youth to understand, to realize that there's no special powers behind being a scientist or an astrophysicist. It just takes a lot of dedication, a lot of commitment, hard work and curiosity and love for learning. And just being the first person to discover something new, there's a huge thrill to that. Because of my commitment towards advancing the gender equality agenda within STEM subjects broadly, and the role understanding more and more and realizing the importance of storytelling in getting these messages across and making these subjects quite reachable for the audience and 
subjects that people can identify with and engage with and be interested in. And so these two things came together, this commitment I had to spread that message and my love of storytelling, you know, being from Lebanon and we have lots of stories and the Thousand and One Nights and Shahrazad, the storyteller. And so how can we merge these two? How can we transform what we're doing in terms of research, this really impactful research that women are doing all over the globe? How can we transform these into impactful messages that people relate to and start thinking, uh -huh. So there's this Latina doing incredible space research or this this lady from India who is working on, you know, in, in biology or genetics or chemistry or whatever it is. And so using storytelling, She Speaks Science started to promote a positive identity around STEM and who does STEM feeds, STEM science, technology, engineering and maths changing the perspective, because what we have seen is that we have promoted the image of a scientist as a person we look up to, rather than someone we identify with and someone we can be. And so changing that perspective, and at the same time, promote the women who are doing uh, uh, science all over the world so that the younger generation can start to identify with these people and think, oh, I can do that too. Oh, it is tough there's difficulties, there's failure, and it's okay. And so through She Speaks Science, we tell stories from these women on not just astronomy or space science, biology, computer science, engineering, space exploration. Um, and we started translating them into different languages. So they're available in, in Arabic because of my background, in Italian, in Spanish, in German, and of course in English. Could you also tell us a little bit more about your new mentorship program, PENTA? Yeah, so besides the stories that I mentioned, which we, uh, which are a core and essential part of She Speaks Science, we recently launched a program called PENTA 5. And the idea behind PENTA is that we have a very tightly knit community of women and girls from all over the world, particularly from five different regions. So Asia, Middle East, Africa, uh, Europe and the US and Latin America to ensure that we have this intersectionality, this broad representation. Uh, and women from uh, on the program are from five different career stages. So executive level working in STEM subjects and then professionals. So these could be postdocs, researchers or even working in industry, uh, university students, could be finishing their PhD or their master's degree, high school students and school students. And the idea is that the program runs for five months to keep in keeping with the theme of five. And during these five months, this network of women and girls engage in mentoring and being mentored in a cascade fashion. So for example, if you are a professional in this network, you will be mentored by the executive and you will be mentoring the person just underneath you on that career ladder who would be the uh, university student. And the university student in turn would be mentoring the school student, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the idea behind this is to nurture the idea, the thought that whoever you are, whatever your career stage is, someone is looking up to you. You are someone's role model and someone's mentor. And we launched on the 11th of February, International Day of uh, Women and Girls in Science. And each month we explore a different theme. So besides the monthly meetings between the mentor and the mentee, uh, we have monthly meetings in which we explore a certain uh, theme. So the idea behind PENTA is that it's a launch mission, launch into a destination that's very exciting, say Mars, for example. So we started with the launch and how you launch your career. And then we moved to the jettison phase, how you let go, just like a spaceship needs to let go of its uh, booster rockets once they, they run out of fuel, you really need to let go of these um, 
So how do we let go of these mindsets, negative mindsets, which do not serve us anymore, like imposter syndrome, self-doubt, all of these things. And then we move to the cruise phase, you know, exploring different options. And then we move into uh, the landing phase and exploration phase. And in each phase, we explore the parallels for what it means to us in terms of our career. We explore ideas like, you know, visibility, public speaking, work-life balance, etc. And um, the program has been, you know, th this is a pilot program. So we weren't really sure how it would be received. And in the first time we ran it, which, which was, you know, this year, uh, the feedback that we got and the number of applications we received was so incredible and the quality of applications was so truly incredible and amazing and it really shows the need for this kind of connections for the networking element for this aspect and as the the Penta crew go, they go through this, these phases. We're learning about how they're building their profile, their LinkedIn pages, they're applying to internships, to, um, to training programs that their mentors told them about. So it's really becoming a very, very exciting adventure for uh, this group of uh, women and girls. And we're very excited about that. And they hail from 24 different countries. Imagine we have 33 women and girls on this network and they come from 23, 24 different countries. And so it's truly incredible the diversity that we're seeing. And it's very exciting. And I look forward to the future versions of Penta as well. On the subject of mentoring, our organization, Space Court Foundation, focuses on increasing accessibility to space law and policy. And mentorship is an area we have identified even in earlier episodes on the series as a crucial link. So from this perspective, what challenges have you identified in accessing space education in Lebanon? It's a, a spot on um, a, a remark uh, really about the role of mentorship and the role of network. If you think about the challenges the space education uh, field is, fa is facing in Lebanon, apart from the challenges that are not unlike any other challenges we face at the moment, given that the situation of Le in Lebanon is, is challenging in itself, um, whether economic aspects, financial, political, um, etc. Um, but because it's uh, it's uh, it's not a hugely developed uh, sector, the space sector in Lebanon, we don't have a space agency, for example. Although we do have um, lots of groups working in you know astronomy and space research, a huge. A very crucial factor in my career while I was still in Lebanon is having mentors from outside of Lebanon, not just inside Lebanon, who I could ask questions, who I could come to, to for opportunities, for ideas, for, you know, like as a, as a PhD, as a master's student, and then later as a PhD student, I had, I had all these questions. And I also needed to understand where I'm standing in this kind of bigger community of space research. Am I doing well? Is what I'm researching relevant? And so reaching out to these people through giving, going to conferences and building networks, connecting with researchers who are doing similar things in Europe, in the US, everywhere in the world, it was really a very crucial factor for me to be able to get my PhD because my, um, my PhD committee was included uh, professors from the US, professor from Spain, in addition to the professors from Lebanon. And so this really played a role, N meeting these people, um, because in Lebanon, it can also be a bit isolating. So for example, when I was doing my PhD, I was doing my PhD only with my PhD supervisor. It was just the two of us working on this research. In contrast, when I came to Cambridge and I started working at the Institute of Astronomy, when, when a PhD student is working on, a, on, a, on, a, on, their, on their degree, on their thesis, they're generally working within bigger groups, could be five, six, or even more, involving postdocs. Uh, senior postdocs, professors, etc., and also master's students and sometimes undergrads. So there's always this brainstorming, always this collaboration, this cooperation. And you have also easy access to groups everywhere else 
uh, working on similar topics. So this factor of isolation can be intimidating, can be demotivating for a researcher working in places like Lebanon and elsewhere. And so my advice would be to build these connections with everywhere else, to go to conferences, network, speak at every opportunity you have and start building these bridges. Uh, these are the bridges that enabled me throughout my career. Thank you, Gina, for that moving and insightful discussion. You truly are a leading example to many hopefuls in the international space sector. Space Court Foundation will announce details for episode five soon. Until then, please like this video, subscribe and follow our social media pages for updates.